Hey gang, it's Jonathan Eder at the Piano Lesson. A um, lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of new interesting things uh, in the paper. I uh, saw a really interesting article in the New York Times uh, about a pretty important person in the jazz world named Sam Rivers, who's unfortunately no longer with us. But uh, Sam Rivers, uh, he was a great composer, tenor saxophonist, played a lot of instruments, actually played bass clarinet and flute and harmonica and piano. And, but he was part of a movement of music, a free kind of a free jazz uh, movement. And by the way, the, the term free jazz can mean a lot of things <laughs> to a lot of people. Um, I think that his free jazz movement was much more approachable than, than others. Um, but uh, it, was, it was just sort of raw energy. And... It was part of what's become known as a the loft movement, the jazz loft movement, which started in 1970. And he was at the fore of that movement, of the loft, jazz loft movement. Uh, and it kind of petered out in the 80s. So we're hearing a lot about now the 50th anniversary of rap that started uh, at a backyard barbecue in 1973 or something like that. But uh, we don't hear anything about this. Uh, this this was really important, and uh, unfortunately, it didn't have quite the staying power uh, as rap did. But um, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Massachusetts is having a show, uh, and it's featuring uh, Jason Moran's artwork as well. He was a pianist, is a pianist, um, who played with Sam Rivers, um, and uh, incidentally, uh, it just happened to. Uh, bump into uh, one of my teachers uh, on the internet, Rufus Reed, a uh, bass, great bass player, who did play with Sam Rivers. We were going back and forth. He was telling me about concerts he did uh, back in the day in different cities, along with Dave Holland. He was telling me that uh, Sam Rivers had two of everything. So it was him and Dave Holland playing bass. But if you, if you just go to, to YouTube and you type in Sam Rivers and Clearly, on the first thing that comes up, uh, there's one particular recording uh, I seem to recall with uh, Ron Carter and Jackie Byard playing piano. Um, just incredible music. Uh, so important, so energetic. And uh, uh, so anyway, the New York Times uh, wrote an article about, about this, how Sam Rivers and his studio, his studio is called Riv Bia. So... Uh, it was it was uh, how it was a seminal force in the jazz world during that uh, 19, through the 1970s and uh, up to like I guess 1980. Um, okay, enough of that little public service announcement. Um, one, I sometimes I lie in bed and I, I think about music. Uh, usually when my cat wakes me up and. Uh, Usually it's, it's like three or four in the morning and I can't go back to sleep. Uh, and uh, I was thinking about how more than one song can exist in the same space and the same time. So what I mean by that is when we're learning music, we're learning anything, we learn, we learn in a very kind of linear way. We, we, we sort of separate things with here's a song here then we learn this song then we learn that song right but if you take if you think rather than thinking in terms of a song I think in terms of a form like a blues form like a 12 bar blues form you could take all those songs and lay them on top of one another and there's a congruency right what's the congruency the congruency is the fact that they occupy the same space in a sense. They're the same 12 bars. They're essentially the same or similar chord changes. And uh, I, th I think that um, the more you play music, over time, you start to think of music or to think of, think of many different songs as one big song. I mean, that's really ultimately what we're after, more, more of a holistic view. So what? So let me just play a little bit what I mean by that. 
Um, there's a great song, a Duke Ellington song, um, called Sea Jam Blues. And I'm going to play an F just because I have, <laughs> I have some other songs. I can play in C, but I can play an F. Um, it's, oh, Duke's Place. Sometimes, sometimes it's called Duke's Place, but uh, you, you hear this. Hmm. Well, that's the wrong note. I think with just two notes, I can play the right notes. Hmm. That's it. F7. Bump, B flat. Mm, 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 C. Right? That's what makes that so special. It's just two notes for God's sakes, but it's it's you have this interval, this perfect fourth, and uh, it's kind of like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know, da 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 dum, da 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 dum, taking this little tiny little kernel of an idea and exploiting it over time. Da 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 rhythmically, da 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 dum, da 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 dum, da 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 dum, da 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 dum, dum dum. Finally, right? But that's kind of what Duke Ellington is doing. Now here, here's another tune. Uh, Sunny Moon for Two, Sunny Rollins. Oh, that's normally in B flat. I played it in F. Um, so just just saying, you know, uh, I think, uh, clicking through some songs here. Oops, what's that? Okay, I don't know. Anyway, um, that's an interesting tune because uh, he does something very interesting compositionally. Uh, major third, that's the A natural, and then he does minor third. And that's really where jazz lives. Jazz lives somewhere in that world between major and minor third, that, that ambiguity in there. It's, very, it's a very unique kind of music because it, 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 it's seemingly contradictory. You seem it's seemingly major and minor at the same time. If you listen to what I'm playing, I'm playing four notes right now. I'm playing F, A flat, A natural, C. And I could lift up the A flat and it sounds major or lift up the A and it sounds minor or emphasize the middle notes and you know but right that's kind of the essence of the sound um, I was looking for a uh, Milt Jackson tune here I had um, I was yeah bags were right right bags were there we go that's what I was looking for so bags were Ah, uh, was that? Uh, 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 oh, oh. No, no, this. <laughs> That's it. Uh, uh, uh. The song sounds so familiar, you forget what note to start on. See, that was F, C, perfect fifth, where Duke's place. That's C, F. Okay, I mean, how, and then, and then, uh, uh, it's kind of a blues, kind of a minor pentatonic blues. Uh, that's Milt Jackson, okay. So there's, there's three tunes right there. And they all exist kind of in the same space. So what's to prevent someone from doing, uh, I do. I played a bit of each song, one after another, and I just inserted that bit of song at the appropriate place in the musical form. Uh, it's such a simple idea. I don't know why I don't see more people doing it. 
And I don't understand why more people don't approach improvisation that way. Because it seems like the emphasis that people put on improvisation is coming up with cool licks and slick ideas and, and pyrotechnical lines and um, that's all well and good. But what gives those melodic lines meaning, right, is their context. It's where they are in the song and it's when you play it, right? Not just what you play, but when you play it. And it's burdensome, especially in the beginning, to try to come up with those kinds of ideas, especially when, if you haven't, if you're a beginner and you haven't played a lot of music, or even if you've played a lot of music, but maybe you're just not so acquainted with improvisation. Um, you know, you have to be kind of disposed to the idea of improvisation. I, I may mention I have a, had a great friend who was a, a, a consummate pianist, won the Tchaikovsky uh, uh, piano competition. <laughs> and I would, privately, I would hear him practicing in an improvisatory way, but ultimately he could never go on stage that way. He was playing the end, practicing the end of a piece, and I was just hanging out, listening to him practice, and he said to me, hey, you know, what, what should I do? How should I end it? I said, well, why don't you just do whatever comes to you at the moment at the concert? And he was so shocked by that. Like, how could you possibly do that? You have to plan it. And I'm like, well, okay, I mean, it's fine. I get that, but I don't really operate that way all the time. You know, I have, I have plan A, but also I have plan B and C, and I don't get too bent out of shape about which plan I use kind of depends. And sometimes I throw them all out the window and try something else. And sometimes I fall on my face and it doesn't work. And keep in mind, by the way, the audience doesn't know what plan you have, right? I mean, they really don't know. Okay, if it's a classical piece of music, yeah, people have certain expectations of what notes you're going to play. If you play a wrong note, like, you know, that could be a horrible thing. But um, this, this idea that... Um, of, of the form being more important, right? So taking a piece of music and learning to kind of play a shell game with it and move it move it around. So the first time I started with, um, I started with, well, I don't have to start with that. I could start with it. to it, uh, this the bag's groove starts on an incomplete measure, so that's when you count four. One, two, three, four, one. So if I'm going to insert it at the right spot, right, I have to make sure that rhythmically I'm doing it correctly. It's easy to get kind of thrown off. I was even, I'll just, I'll just kind of try that again. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Sunny Moon for two starts on a syncopation. One, one. Just a little example now. Of course, I started to go out, started to go off into my own world there a little bit, and 
play other lines that weren't part of that little subset of notes that we talked about, you know, from the from the compositions. But another important thing, really important thing, I, uh, maybe the most important thing about improvising, is that, you know, when you, you want your improvisations to be an outgrowth of the piece, you want it to grow organically, if for no other reason than to please the audience. Um, I used to hear very often, uh, growing up, learning to improvise, that uh, it, if you're if you're playing a tune, you want uh, the, you want anyone to be able to walk in at any point and know what tune you're playing. And that includes a drum solo as well. That was like you know, it's, drummers can play melodically. They can, there are rhythmic elements that are indicative of the melody, right? But to be able to, um, you know. Uh, be I, I kind of call it um, an extension of the composer, but you know you are the composer in effect because most of these composers aren't, around, aren't with us anymore. <laughs> They're gone, right? So you you are carrying the mantle. You're taking up the mantle of these composers, and it's okay. You know, there's a certain responsibility, I suppose, an obligation, uh, if for no other reason than than just to make the tune sound good, but. You really want you really want to uh, try to explore the possibilities of the piece. Now I'm kind of going in a circular discussion today because going back to the whole thing about the loft movement in New York and free jazz and Sam Rivers. In fact, it's funny. I remember I remember um, meeting Bill Watrous one day. Um, he was doing a concert somewhere in New Jersey, at Rumpel College. Yeah, and uh, afterwards they announced that he was going to uh, give private lessons. And I thought, oh, that's great. I don't play trombone, but I'm going to take a lesson with this guy. And so I went up to him afterwards, and uh, I said, well, I'd like to take a lesson. He said, well, I don't play the piano. I said, well, that's OK. It's fine. You know, just be good. I'm sure you could teach me something. And uh, he's like, well, I don't read music. Why is that? Blah, 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 blah. And he's <laughs> kind of grumpy. Um, it turned out to be a great lesson. I, I learned a tremendous amount of money. I, I learned a tremendous amount of money. Was that subconscious? I, <laughs> I didn't. It, I really think I do think of knowledge as wealth, though. I suppose I do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've never been motivated by money, I'm, for better or worse. But I, I'm motivated by learn through learning. My mother was a teacher, valued education in our house. Um, and I think he was a little surprised. I don't think he expected me to play as well as I did. I was a kind of a kid, but he, I think he was kind of surprised that I did play that well. Um, and I remember at one point he kind of went on a, a little rant about Ornette Coleman. That guy's a charlatan, and I, you know. And so um, I'm not the person to talk about uh, uh, or, or, or to talk about Ornette Coleman. I, for better or worse don't actually know that much about Ornett Coleman. But, you know, if you're lo looking at the free jazz category, that's probably one of the places to, to look. In any event, if you listen to Sam Rivers, uh, you will again hear um, this this kind of raw energy. You know, there's very few times I've really, really heard this like wonderful raw energy. Once I was in New York, listened to Elvin Jones play drums um, at the Field Vanguard. And you just you just kind of hear it's it's just like a like a, a force of nature coming through you know it's really in, incredible. Um, but but uh, making your improvisation organic, making it uh, come come from the material that the composer gave you. But again, you don't have to use just that composer. If you stack up, you know a hundred different blues pieces, right? You can pick from various pieces. Now, you could call that quoting, perhaps. Some people call it quoting. Uh, quoting. Ah. Hear that? That's a, a quote. Okay. Um, very obvious kind of quote. But making, making these pieces, exploring, here's the word, ready? The possibilities, the possibilities of the piece. When I think of 
music at its best, and particularly jazz, and particularly improvisation. Jazz is about um, possibilities, first and foremost. When you, when, you, when you hear people playing, it's not so much the piece itself. The piece is a point of departure. It's an excuse to jump off. So you look at a great work of art, so to, again, bring, going back to the, the art exhibit, where they're recreating, they're actually recreating this loft environment in some way, shape, or, or form, uh, and I believe along with some musical performances. But uh, if you, if you uh, think about jazz more as not so much what it is, but what it could be, what, what it, it's this, this sense of exhilaration that anything's possible. Right, um, that's what it's more about to me. And some people feel comfortable doing that and exploring, and other people kind of don't feel comfortable doing that. Or maybe they'd like to, but they're they're not able to. And for you guys out there that might be a little timid or scared about doing this, hey, you know what? Just make some sound. Yeah, it, it's just music. It's nothing's gonna. It's not gonna hurt. <laughs> and you know what? It doesn't make a mess either. As soon as you're done making the music, it all goes away anyway. So, uh, you know. I had a great voice teacher, Walter Blazer, who used to teach voice at the Manhattan School of Music, um, taught all the opera singers there. And, he, and he, would, he would always say, he says, you solve musical problems with sound. It was a very uh, astute comment because the temptation as a singer is to hold back, especially when you're just learning, be kind of timid, not really make sound. But no, you actually have to do the opposite. You have to actually create sound. And I... I taught a lot of voice actually done a lot of vocal coaching uh, and uh, because of his training and uh, just as a little sidebar there there's kind of two categories of that there's voice lessons where you learn the mechanics of how to produce sound and then there's the vocal coaching which is where you learn to apply your the mechanics to repertoire to songs so, uh, so and some people are more equipped to do one or the other or both. Certainly it's easier to be a vocal coach if you can play the piano because it's nice to have, an, you need an accompanist. So sometimes vocal coaches don't play the piano, they have accompanists, you know. But if you play the piano, then it's that much easier. And of course, if you're, if you, if you're doing classical music or operatic work or, you know, and, and there are pieces in other languages, well then you, should, you know, that's another layer of complexity. You have to know those languages. Um, I am not a, a great, person in languages, so that's not exactly what I do, but I am pretty good with the other stuff in general. Um, but, uh, um, to, and to me, that's why jazz is an American art form. If you think one thing about America, not to get too political, but if you think about the, the United States and the country of America, it's all about possibilities, isn't it? I mean, that's sort of the, the stereotype, you know, I guess they sometimes they use the phrase like American dream, right? That could mean anything it's um, but the the idea that that uh, almost everything and anything else sometimes they say only in America right but uh, that's what that's what jazz is supposed to, to be about sometimes it's happy accidents anyway I'm gonna do a, maybe a little bit of playing uh, and uh, let's just make a happy accident and kind of see what happens because uh, I don't I don't I don't really know what's what's going to happen.
guys have a good week. This is Jonathan Eater. Getting ready to sign off at the piano lesson. And if any of you cats need to contact me, please send me an email with your comments or questions. Got to want to do a private lesson? Hit me up. See you next time, guys. Take care.